Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of February 24th, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on Tuesdays from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss our concern that the governor's current path on budget issues is leading straight to another year of deep PFD cuts. Second, we explain why the Senate Finance Committee's leading proposal on a spending cap doesn't do much. And third, we discuss the impact of the recent Goldman, Chase, and others' decisions to curtail funding of Alaska oil investments and our view of how the state should respond. And now, let's join Michael. Um, So let's dive down into this, Brad. Uh, I was just talking, I just played the governor's interview on uh, Alaska Insights, talking about, you know, kind of what his game plan is, which, I mean, I've been trying to suss out and figure out what his game plan is. Uh, I'm not quite sure. I'm wondering if this is all about the the vetoes at the end. But I think it's basically kind of a tag your it situation where he has just passed the baton to the legislature and said, OK, you didn't like what I did. Fine. Here here it is. And, well, and by the way, I proposed these three amendments that would have helped, but you guys didn't even look at him. He's kind of just passing the ball right into their court. He is. And um, and, and I'm afraid uh, it, it's a turnover. I mean, I'm afraid he's passed the ball into their court, and I think they've they've taken it and and they know exactly what they want to do, uh, which is to just cut the PF uh, the PFD again. I mean, it's it, he. I, I understand what he's saying in the Alaska Insights interview. I understand the frustration of last year, uh, where he got burned badly uh, by by trying to be proactive with with spending cuts and and pushing forward on a. On a, on a right-sizing government agenda, I understand the frustration. I understand the the, the pain of that, and 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 what that what that does to a person. Uh, but the but the proposal this year is is basically, as you say, to pass the ball into the other court and say, you know, tag, you're it. You guys, uh, you guys, you know, come up with your own ideas. The problem with that, from from our perspective. Uh, is that they know exactly what they want to do in both houses, which is to use the PFD as the punching bag, use it as the as the uh, as another savings account, uh, and draw that down. So they're not really interested. Neither body is really interested in coming up with their own set of proposals, revenue proposals, or spending spending proposals, um, and and doing what the governor says he wants them to do, which is feedback to him, a variety of proposals, so there's give and take. They're just set on, both bodies are set uh, on using PFD cuts as the way of balancing the budget. And frankly, they're just sitting there going, wow, the governor gave the ball to us. Okay, well, we'll, we'll hold it and run the clock out. Um, and then at the end, we'll, uh, we'll take the final shot. We know exactly what that shot is. We know exactly where it's going. And, it's, and, and the governor's essentially saying he's not going to put up any defense when we when we take that shot, so it's it's a it's a very very frustrating situation. The governor's plea that uh, the legislature take up the constitutional amendments. Uh, if the if the if the legislature was serious about that, um, they would have kept Mike Shower on uh, Senate Finance. Mike Shower, the, the constitutional amendments went through State Senate Affair or Senate State Affairs last year while Mike was chairman of that. He worked on them hard. He remolded them. 
Uh, he, he developed uh, support for them, passed them on to judiciary. Judiciary passed on one, maybe, the spending cap on to Senate Finance, and then Senate Finance promptly excuse me, introduced its own bill and forgot about the constitutional amendment on the spending cap. So uh, there's, no, there's no movement on, on these constitutional amendments in the Senate. There's been none. Uh, over on the House side, they sort of they went into the House and sort of like they went into a black hole someplace. Right. Um, and and they, they aren't going to go forward. So it's just, from, from the governor's standpoint, I understand how why he starts this the way he does. I got burned last year by coming out up front with, with all my, with my spending cut proposals. You guys take the ball. But the problem is they know exactly what they're going to do with the ball, and it's not what the governor wants, and it's what uh, it's not what what is in the best interest of the state. Certainly, uh, you're just sort of giving the ball over to the top twenty percent uh, and uh, and letting well, them uh, c- control the block w- the clock. Well, let let me play devil's advocate for a second because I'm wondering. Yeah, again, I'm just this is all thinking, just kind of uh, you know thinking out loud. But as I watch this, and I agree, I mean, he's kind of just passed the ball over to them. But I mean, does this allow them to? You know, does is he thinking that he can get them to kind of paint themselves into this corner as cutters of the PFD, and then he could come in and veto uh, any of this extra spending, and then maybe have the fight at the end, uh, and then maybe tie this up into the elective uh, into the election season. Uh, I mean, it, can he paint them in the picture? You know, in that way, or do you think that that's wishful thinking on his part? I mean, I don't know if it's his thinking, but I'm just kind of thinking out loud here. You know that would that would that might make sense in some scenarios, but his budget was sort of a status quo budget. It was a four point five billion dollar plus or minus operating budget, four point six five billion dollar uh, total UGF budget. By the time you add in uh, capital spending, and that sort of capital, that sort of a, a, a status quo budget, the the legislature um, is is tinkering with that. Uh, in uh, around the ferries, uh, they're going to tinker with that. I think with respect to the university, um, and and sort of you know move some numbers around, but not materially. So, at the end of this legislative process, what it's looking like the appropriations process is he gets a budget back that's not materially different than the one he sent. Now, does he at that point say, "Well, I was expecting you to fund it"? Um, uh, and and uh, fund it differently than, than the PFD. And since you didn't, I'm going to veto it now. I'm going to veto these spending measures because I don't like what you're doing on the revenue side. Maybe. Uh, but that seems, I mean, the legislature would then paint him as, 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 as going back on, on, on his initial proposal about spending levels and sort of reignite the whole, uh, the whole debate last year. I, what, what I would have hoped the governor would have done, I mean, I'm going to go to this again. The OMB 10-year plan, I think, is an excellent document. And the five scenarios he lays out in there, um, I think, are, are exactly the scenarios we ought to be considering. And the fifth scenario, the balance scenario, I think, is, is an excellent landing point uh, for the state. It's sort of the all-of-the-above approach. You give a little bit, you give a little bit, you give a little bit, and we finally arrive at a sustainable long-term fiscal plan. But even when Lori uh, Townsend tried to prod him on Scenario 5, tried to prod him on the balance, right. he didn't really take ownership of it. Yeah. Um, and, and so, I, I, I mean, that's, if, if, if I were in his position, I would be you know, talking about Scenario 5 every hour of the day. This is the landing spot well, we ought to be driving toward. Well, yeah, but I, I think that, you know, this is, I think that's as far as he wants to take the idea of Scenario 5 is literally publishing it. I don't think he necessarily wants to own it because, again, it's antithetical to Republicans to want to propose taxes, right? I mean, that's the death knell, well, for most Republicans. The ones that are in the Senate don't seem to give two hoots uh, as long as it's not a tax that directly affects them. Uh, but, I mean, he, you know, again, he he ran on a platform of really no new taxes. So I think that might be as far as he politically feels that he can go is by including it in the OMB plan and kind of mentioning it in passing, but not really endorsing it. Well, that 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 sounds logical. But the problem then is there's no one advocating it because the legislature is not going to advocate it. They've got they've got their PFD cut approach uh, and they're perfectly happy to play to play that role. I mean. 
you listen to Bryce, you listen to, certainly if you listen to Giesel, uh, the, you know, the PFD is too high. We got to get the PFD, the PFD is down. It's unsustainable. I mean, I, I, I saw a part of Gary Knopp's uh, presentation down at the Kenai, down in his district in Kenai. Uh, and it's, uh, we, we've got to do a, a PFD that's affordable, that, that we can afford clearly signaling that it's the leftover approach, whatever's left over at the end of the state, taking what, what it wants to out of the revenue stream, then, then we'll sort of distribute the rest of it to the, to the, to the legislature. So there's no, I mean, scenario five has no owner then, has no advocate then. You've got a situation where the governor says, I don't know, I tried, you guys try. And they say, fine, we know exactly what we're doing. <laughs> right. Thank you very much. Right. Thanks for, um, thanks for the help. We're on our way. And, right. Exactly, and so you've got no, you've got no one advocating this the the, the balanced middle. You know, I mean, the sort of the most public advocate of the balanced middle is me, and that's 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 really. I mean, you're really in a sad situation when you've got that. So right, um, it, it's it's it, it, it it's just a very. I mean, it's like this. It's like this huge chasm. Uh, the governor's you know sort of opened up this huge chasm by not advocating. Um, Anything really, uh, other than, other than you know, it's the legislature's turn. I tried last year. It's the legislature's turn, and the legislature going fine. Thank you very much. Um, right. And and there's really there's really no one trying to develop another alternative. No one in government trying to develop another alternative at this point. Uh, it's just um, it, it's it's just as you said at the beginning, the governor passed the ball. The the legislature took it. <laughs> And they're going to run out the clock and then and then run their play that they know that they know how to run and uh, and the governor's not really putting up well, the defense to it. It'll take some real uh, you know delicate political tinkering to try and lay this at their feet, which I, I mean I think is possible, but I think will be very tough. So that's number one, the governor's plan, which leads us one, into number. Go ahead. One one thing we 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 should mention in connection with that is the recall. How okay. the recall is over, is overlaying on all that. Um, and and the recall now can go off anytime. The recall election could be anytime, if, uh, assuming they get the seventy thousand uh, signatures, anytime between June and August. So the governor's got to be thinking about that recall sitting in there too, uh, as he gets down to the end of the uh, end of the legislative session. And uh, and I think that plays that plays a role. Yeah, no, absolutely. And am I ascribing way too much here uh, to the governor and to his team? On this, because I just I keep maybe maybe I mean maybe it's wishful thinking on my part, but I just keep hoping that there's some kind of long term you know long game here, some kind of end game politically where they're going to come back and spin it around and say, see, look, these guys, you know, during the election cycle, they did this and they did that. Or do you think it's just running scared, which is kind of you know the intimation from the recall effort and everything else. I mean, do you do you give a weight to that one way or the other, 50-50? What, what are your thoughts? Well, Michael, I, I would hope that you're right. I would hope that there's a political game plan to it to push this all back on the legislature and to say, you guys didn't come up with an adequate funding plan, uh, and so I'm going to you know veto or I'm going to you know re-implement my, my spending cut plan um, and, and essentially put pressure on them that way. But but politically, you want to be signaling that stuff. You want to be sort of laying the groundwork of, I gave you a chance to do this right. You didn't do it. Um, and now I'm going to make you pay for it. And now I'm going to shove it down your throat. Uh, the governor's not doing any of that signaling. If he, if he comes up, the, the, sort of the, the problem is, if he comes up at the end, I was talking to somebody yesterday and they said, well, what the governor ought to do is, if they rely on 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 a PFD, is he just ought to veto the entire budget and say no? We're going to have a we're going to we're going to follow the statute on the PFD and we're going to stay in session until you do a veto. If he was going to do that, you ought to be laying the groundwork for that now by saying that's what I'm going to do, um, and 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 start to put pressure on the legislature, sort of holding that, being silent about that, and 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 assuming you can do that at the end somehow. Um, I think I think is is um, it, it's a it's a challenged political strategy because the governor's not laid a good groundwork for it. He's not gotten a, a a swell of public support behind him for that. He's not put pressure on the on the legislature, and the legislature gets to the end and would say, "Look, you told us to you know 
you want you were waiting for proposals from us. Well, here's our proposal. We're doing it on uh, on on the backs of of the PFD, and it's not like a surprise. It's a surprise, Governor. That's what we did last year. That's what we've done for the last four years. So you you surely didn't expect us to do anything different. You know, you are creating a crisis here. You, Governor, are creating a crisis here at the end by coming in with all these vetoes uh, and telling us to solve the problem. We did. You knew, we, and we were very clear along, this is how we were going to do it. And now you're creating a crisis by coming at the end and said, well, you want it some way different. The, the governor needs to be, if, if that's where he's going, if, 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 if this is going for an end game where he's going to blame the legislature for not coming up with the right, with the right solution, he needs to be laying the groundwork by telling them that if they go this direction, he's going to, he's going to veto. I, otherwise, it's, uh, I think he's the one that looks bad in the end if he tries to, if he tries to pull the rug out from, from uh, under the legislature at the end. Uh, Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Um, we are about two minutes out here in the break, uh, and I'm looking back to see if there's any uh, com- Harold, of course, says, did anyone hear flat tax? I'm late to the party. Haven't mentioned flat tax once, Harold. You're the culprit. You're the guy that mentioned it first today. So good on you. Good. Thanks for bringing it up. Brad, flat tax. I It's... <laughs> It's really, I mean, again, going back to the balanced approach, he, he doesn't mention it specifically, but I, I think really, truthfully, uh, the, what I laid out was probably the scenario, is that he felt like he could put it in the in the recommendations uh, of the number five balanced approach, but he can't really endorse it. He could put it out there and throw it out there and say, look, I put it out there, but because of, uh, you know, kind of his promises during election and everything else, he can't really endorse it. Uh, and, and that's... And that's uh... That's unfortunate, Michael, uh, because the, the the what we're getting down to is it's either going to be PFD cuts or something else more balanced. I mean, the legislature has been clear. This legislature has been clear that they're going to rely on PFD cuts. They're not they're not they're not trying to hide the ball. They're not you know, they're, they're very clear about it. Um, and and in the only way that we're going to avoid a future of funding government through PFD cuts only is to have another approach out there and and for people to be advocates of it. And 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 I think the balanced approach, which has a third coming from further budget cuts, a third coming from PFD restructuring, and a third coming from other taxes, uh, more equitable taxes, I think is is exactly the right approach that gets us to a to to a good landing spot in the state, creates a sustainable budget, and we sort of sort of go forward and 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 have a have a sustainable uh, okay. uh, fiscal plan. This this hail mary of the thirteen hundred and six dollar supplemental for the fully funded or the back payment of dividend. I mean, is that just posturing? Is that just signaling? What what is that? That's the governor sticking with his his mantra of we ought to follow the law, um, and it's 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 a it's a him following through on that mantra, sending it off to the legislature. I don't think anybody. Uh, uh, has any expectation that's going to go any place in the legislature. Uh, but I think it's just, you know, the governor sort of checking off that box of, did I propose things that followed the law? Yes, I did. Here's the bill I submitted. Uh, Not my uh, fault. Turn in my... <laughs> right, exactly. Not my fault that the legislature doesn't want to follow the law, which, again, I think it gives it just more ammunition for that argument that uh, that, that they may need to take ownership of it. I'm, I'm, maybe I'm ascribing way too much political acumen to the governor's team at this point, but I, could, I mean, a guy could hope. Uh, but it leads us to number two, which, of course, is was his defense with Lori Townsend here in that piece that I just played, where he said, look, it's the it's the constitutional amendments, including the spending cap. Uh, well, the legislature's decided they're going to do a spending cap of their own, which, as you mentioned, uh, completely ignores the governor's idea and is uh, a little bit different. It's uh, It's an appropriations limit based on not on spending or not on uh, revenue, not on anything else. It's based on previous appropriations. It, give us a quick snapshot before we go to break, and we can rejoin it here. Well, the the Senate spending cap is is a fig leaf. It's just it's it's their proposal, and it's the only proposal that's really moving the legislature right now. It's their proposal to say they're doing a spending cap, to say they they followed through on a spending cap, but it's not constitutional. It's statutory only. And if you look at its chart, at the at the chart that, that even the Senate puts out, uh, the spending cap stays well above 
our actual revenue level, uh, even if you count in the PFD. It's it's a it's it's lower than the sort of the the current uh, non applicable non attainable spending cap we've got in the Constitution, but but it's falling between um, uh, where revenues actually are and that and that and that current uh, constitutional spending cap. It doesn't achieve anything other than to give the Senate a talking point and say, "Yep, we consider it a spending cap," and 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 you know they may even pass it and say, "Yeah, we passed the spending cap." But it's not an effective one. Right, right. Continuing with Brad Keithley here on Alaska's uh, uh, Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. We're talking about the weekly top three. We had just gotten into number two for this week, which is Brad's discussion on, uh, you know, the leading proposals on a spending cap uh, here in the legislature. Um, and it just, it really doesn't really help anything. And they're not even really pushing it. I mean, they're talking about it. But even if they did pass it, First of all, it's statutory, which not we know that they only they only listen to the laws that they want to listen to. And second of all, even if they did follow it, it really doesn't help anything because again, it's based on uh, on on past spending and, and expenditures. It's not based on uh, actual revenue, which of course is really one of the only responsible ways to try and set a spending cap in there is basing it on past revenue, so you have a good idea of where you're going. Uh, Brad, final thoughts here on number two. What could they put in there that would really make a difference, or you know what would uh, you know what would be responsible? Well, two things, Michael. One is to do it through a constitutional amendment because you're exactly right. They only pay attention. They've established the precedent. And the Supreme Court has said they can only pay, they only have to pay attention to the laws they want to, um, and as long as they just do it on a statutory basis, uh, they'll just blow through it uh, uh, when they get when when push comes to shove down the road. Um, and the second thing is, you're exactly right, it needs to be based on revenues. Uh, for those who really want to follow this, the lead bill that the Senate is considering is, S- is SB 104. And go to akledge.com, which is the legislature's website, uh, put SB 104 in the search function. It will click on it. It'll take you to the history of that bill. Look over in Documents. Um, and then look for uh, a PowerPoint that was presented to the legislature at its uh, last hearing uh, on February 4th, um, and then look down to page three uh, of that of that uh, presentation, and it's a it's a nice little chart uh, graphic that graphs out uh, the past spending, past revenues, uh, the current constitutional uh, uh, spending cap. Um, and and a variety of other things, uh, including the proposed the, the spending cap proposed in SB 104. And what you will see is the SB 104 line uh, from FY 21 or FY 20 forward uh, is built on past spending. That line escalates with inflation, and in every year from FY 20 forward, it exceeds revenues. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so. And so what are we doing? I mean, we're building in a spending cap that doesn't cap anything. It is it is as foreign to the revenues that we've got to that we that we've got to deal with as the current spending cap. Right. Um, and 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 so it really all it does is give Natasha and and Giesel and others a talking point saying, well, we've passed the spending cap. We you know, we, we, we've been responsible. We went down there and passed the spending cap, but it doesn't cap anything. Um, and, and it's just, I mean, it's, it's a fig leaf. So to do it responsibly, as we've talked on the show before, we need to base it on revenues, uh, sort of a rolling average of revenues. So it doesn't, so the, the, the spending cap doesn't spike if revenues ever spike again, it sort of rolls up to it, takes into account, uh, low years as well as high years and keeps us sort of in the middle uh, of uh, if we have spikes, uh, uh, revenue spikes, keeps us sort of in the middle of that range uh, and takes into account upturns as well as downturns, but is based on revenue, is right. based on dollars that we have in hand uh, to spend as opposed to this spending cap that's based on past spending and just escalates uh, escalates off the board and, and really doesn't doesn't help us at all. 
We're out of money, Brad. I mean, we're just uh, eventually the yogurt's going to hit the wall. I mean, there's just nothing left, and 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 I don't know what we'll do at that point, but it's rapidly approaching, and and somebody's going to have to take some blame or at least take the bull by the horns and make it happen. I don't know. We, we've offered many solutions on the program here, but nobody seems to be paying attention to us. Uh, all right, well let's 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 move on to number three because we're rapidly running out of time. Number three reared its ugly head, and you could be. You could be said to be prescient. This is something that you and I talked about here uh, in a previous top three, which is the fact that there are financial institutions out there right now. And Ed King actually talked about this in his prediction for the new decade, saying that climate change and especially climate change, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, people who are who make that one of the centerpieces of their political philosophy are going to be more influential in the future and we're already seeing it with uh, uh, Goldman Sachs pulling out and now JP Morgan Chase is saying that they are going to no longer invest in enterprises which are in the Arctic uh, and that's caused some real ripples uh, what are your thoughts well Nat Hertz has a great article in uh, Alaska public media in the in the APRM uh, website he put it up yesterday the the, high, the, the title of it is anxiety creeps into oil-dependent Alaska as banks step back from Arctic investment. Um, and there's a quote in there from Andy Mack, who was the uh, commissioner of resources, natural resources, under Governor Walker. And Andy says, you know, it's sort of, it's, it's sort of we can live through it if, if it's one or two uh, investment banks, but, but if you start adding more investment banks on some of the, or more bankers on top of uh, on top of uh, redlining the Arctic uh, from from oil development, then then it begins to be a problem. And and I think the big story uh, for Alaska, frankly, this week in the oil patch is going to be J.P. Morgan. Goldman sort of got out there in front. Lloyd's Bank of of, of England, Deutsche Bank, some others had been out there in front uh, over in Europe, saying that this was that they were going to redline the Arctic. Uh, Goldman was sort of the first step in the U.S., and people were trying to say, well. Goldman's just, you know, posturing. J.P. Morgan Chase stepping in uh, is significant. Uh, J.P. Morgan Chase is a significant banker to the oil industry, um, and and I think it's it's now we're seeing the more than one that uh, that Andy Max concerned about. Um, and 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 if you read uh, Nat's article, I, it, Nat's done a really good job in this article about sort of capturing the mood of the oil industry. Uh, right now, uh, with respect to this issue, and um, and and you know, his title of anxiety creeps in. I think is is exactly the right the right title. Well, there is a put. I mean, go ahead. No, I was just going to say. I mean, I agree. His article has a very different tone. Suzanne Downing over a must read uh, is quoting and talking about the Washington Post article. Uh, where they quote Pavel uh, Michanov from uh, Raymond James Investments, where he says he cut, they kind of downplay it. They say oil and gas activity in the Arctic is so slim anyway that lending from such activities is essentially is essentially meaningless. Uh, they they kind of downplay it. Um, does it does that really track with your experience as an oil and gas attorney and being part of the industry in the past? No, no, bankers play a critical role uh, in. Uh in the development, particularly among independents, uh, in the development of the Arctic, and what in Nat's article, uh, I put a lot of a lot of credence in because Nat went and talked to oil executives uh, and talked to people who are involved in resource development in the state, and really tried to get a pulse of the industry uh, as opposed to a pulse of of the stray of stray investment banker out there. I there is anxiety. I mean, I can testify personally. Uh, to the fact that I've heard people uh, uh, talk about the concern about this, it's not that it's not that Alaska isn't without weapons. I mean, we talked on we talked last week on the show about the fact that uh, Alaska's carbon footprint, actually development of, of oil resources in Alaska, has a lower carbon footprint than development in the Permian. In the Permian, they're flaring natural gas because right. because a gas produced in association with oil. Uh, has has no value. Uh, they're flaring gas uh, at a at a very high rate, and flaring gas has has huge uh, uh, carbon footprint issues. I was just reading these two articles, and I mean, Downing's is pretty short, but it references this article, and I thought it really did kind of a disservice because it it so seriously it seems to downplay 
even the Washington Post article was not that rosy. She seemed to have plucked like the 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 you know the the uh, the nicest comment out of everything there, uh, trying to downplay this like it's no big deal. But I, I mean, I think this is a pretty big deal. It is a big deal, and in Alaska, as I was as I was in the process of saying, Alaska has a has a good a good defense to it. I mean, people think that when you're drilling in the Arctic, you're going to have a big foot, big carbon footprint because the Arctic has been a place where we've had declining sea ice and 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 you know melting permafrost and various other issues. But those aren't caused by Arctic oil development; they're caused by global CO2 emissions. So what you want, what you really want to focus on is where are those global CO2 emissions coming from, and and you want to if you're going to redline anything because of climate change concerns, redline those projects that have that have the highest uh, the highest uh, uh, CO2 emissions. Uh, the oil sands in Alaska have been targeted. Uh, in fact, Tech Cominco yesterday announced the announced that they were going to shut down a project. Uh, that they that had been in the works uh, to develop a new oil sands field up there, uh, frankly, because they were having uh, funding issues with respect to that project, and because the the economics uh, were no longer uh, viable. That's been a target of the of the environmental groups uh, because of the big carbon footprint. The you mean Permian. in Alberta? You said Alaska. You meant Alberta. The tar sands uh, in Alberta. I meant Alberta. I'm okay. Sorry. Yeah. No problem. Uh, I, uh, thank you for correcting me. Uh, the Permian has a much bigger carbon footprint uh, than Alaska does. So if we're going to target carbon, carbon footprints, we ought not to be just, you know, blithely redlining regions uh, because they happen to be in the Arctic. We ought to be looking at the carbon footprint of those regions. And Alaska, you know, we discussed this on the show last week, uh, the Climate Leadership Council, the, the, the group that has been promoting a, uh, a carbon tax, uh, says Alaska has is lot is a lot better positioned than other regions in terms of its uh, CO2 emissions that we're much better about it than than other regions. So Alaska has a good story to tell, which is that we don't we're not the problem. Um, we we happen to live in the area that's being affected most by the problem, but we aren't the ones contributing to the problem. It's other regions that are contributing to the problem. And I think I think rather than downplaying this issue, because this issue is going to keep going. I mean, J.P. Chase is 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 a is a big player, uh, and they're an important player. And I think them taking this position signals it's a real issue. Um, and 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 we need to instead of downplaying it and ignoring it, we need to get ourselves involved in it and and tell the Alaska story, which is we're not the problem. Look to the Permian. Look at other places. They are the problem. That's where the carbon emissions are coming from. If you want to, if you want to redline somebody because they're not paying attention to their carbon emissions, go redline those places. We're a responsible place to develop. Right. We happen to live in the in the war zone because of because of the effects, but we're not the cause of it. I, I want to take a sec here because people in the chat room are just temporarily losing their mind over the whole carbon footprint comment. Uh, saying, you know, oh, you drank the CO2, or you drank the CO2 Kool-Aid, it's all, B- it's all BS, blah, 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 blah. I mean, look, uh, we could believe and, and think our, to ourselves that carbon footprints and all that stuff is just all but, you know, kind of baloney and everything else. The problem is the powers that be in these situations are seriously creating structures and outlines and regulations based on that. Whether we think it's true or not, whether we think it's right or good or, you know, you know, all this other kind of stuff. I mean, that's great, except that they are making regulations and decisions based on that. Uh, So we have to at least engage in the, when we're planning to be able to at least defend against it. I mean, we have to understand their game to be able to play it. Exactly right, Michael. And, and, you know, we do rely on, Alaska does rely, Arctic projects do rely on on uh, investment bankers and on funding sources, we, we don't we don't generate enough funds on an ongoing basis to fund our own programs, um, and we rely on outside funding for uh, these programs. Oil Search certainly is going to rely on outside funding uh, for these programs, and and in Nat's article, he's got he's here's a quote: Arctic seems to have turned into a four letter word in the minds of a lot of these financial institutions, said an Alaska oil executive. 
who asked not to be named to avoid attention, drawing attention to his particular company. These are, these are the guys on the front line. These are the guys going to try to raise these funds. They're facing these issues rather than, you know, try to stand in Chase's face or Golden's face saying, you guys are full of bullshit because you don't understand the real issue. There is no carbon issue. We need, we need, to, we need to accept that that's what they think is reality and then tell them, look, Alaska is not the problem. If you think there's a carbon issue, Alaska is not the problem. Go, you know, redline Permian. Uh, don't redline uh, Alaska. And, and, you know, ignoring reality, ignoring the, 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 the funding reality that's out there is not a good plan. Right. Well, I agree. And, uh, and, I, and I agree. I think Catherine has it right, which is, is have to get ahead of their narrative instead of arguing against it. That trick works for them and they've been crushing us with it. I mean, that's exactly what we have to do. And, uh, hey, look, Brad even said bullshit after we got off the air, which is good. So I'm glad that we got that. <laughs> glad we got I, I made sure it- yeah, in, in my mind, I made sure I would, we were off the air. <laughs> I think it's I think it's a it's a good call. All right, folks. Um, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for sustainable budgets. Agree with him, love him, hate him. He always brings good, thoughtful stuff to comment about and uh, and discuss here on the program. Thank you, Brad, for coming on board. We appreciate it, my friend. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. It's always a good discussion and always a always a good time when we get a chance to talk with Brad. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.